Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. After his baptism, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during these days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I want all those that are young at heart, especially the children, to come up at this time. Come on up, Lexi. Come on, Scarlett. Come on up here. Mommy and Daddy will see you later. Come on, Scarlett. Come on, Maya. Come on. Remember the question I asked you. Come on, Sebastian. Come on, Nora. Come on, William. Come on up. William, I love those coveralls. How are y'all doing today? You happy? Everybody happy? Happy? Yeah? Okay. Listen, uh, you guys are a lot younger than me. Do y'all know that? Y'all knew that, didn't you? You're a lot younger than me. I I was born a long time ago. Scarlett, you're going to get a stamp, but you have to answer my question first. Remember, this is like the Salvation Army. You have to answer the question. All right, here's the, here's, the, here's the deal. I believe that you guys are, y'all are closer to your birth than I am. How old are you, Scarlett? Three? You're three. How old are you, Lexi? Six. How old is Sebastian? Sebastian, how old are you? Three? Okay. Nora, you're just a little thing, aren't you? William, you too. How old are you, William? William, how old are you? He doesn't even want, he's fascinated by the young lady, Victoria. Okay, that's good, William. Listen, uh, here's the deal. I believe that y'all are closer to your birth than I am, so you know more about God than I do. So I want you to tell me about God right now. Tell me about God. Scarlett, can you tell me something about God? No? How about you, Victoria? Something about God? Just one little thing. Lexi, can you tell me something about God? No. Nobody? Elizabeth, can you tell me something about God? God? God makes miracles happen. How about you, Anna? He loves you? Yeah, okay. How about it, Bridget? What? He's everywhere. Good, okay. All right, how about you, Brian? Something about God? Do what? Creator of everything. Well, you know, those are all good things. It's hard to talk about God, isn't it? Y'all know that? It's hard to talk about God. Do y'all think about God sometimes? Who thinks about God sometimes? 
It's hard to think about God, isn't it? God created everything. And then the question, it begs the question, who created God, right? And then you have to say, well, nobody created God, so God always was. And what, you think, well, what, is, then what does that mean, right? And then you think, well, how did he do it? And God created everything. God sent his son Jesus. That's what we believe. And Jesus, in today's story, the first Sunday of Lent, right, we wear purple, we begin our journey to Easter, and we think about God. Jesus is out in the wilderness, and he's tempted to think about God. The devil says to him, if you're the son of God, you'll do this, right? William, listen to me. You're, you are mesmerized by a little Victoria over there, aren't you? Anyway, that's a good thing. Listen, God is everywhere. God is good. God loves us. God created everything. That's true. But you know what really is important, Brian? God created you to be big and strong, take care of your family, God created you, Scarlet. Scarlet, God created you to want to have a stamp today. Yeah. God created Lexi to be beautiful and inquisitive and Victoria so that she might mesmerize William. <laughs> Although I think William's more interested in his socks right now than he is you, Victoria. God wants us to do one thing. Not think about God so much as to think about God all the time so that God might be the center of our lives and that we might love each other in a way that will build love in the world. And what is today? What's today? What is today? Anything special? Valentine's Day. And what's Valentine's Day about? Love, right? Come on, I got you a stamp of the heart on it. It's a little walking heart, is what it is. It's really cute. Very cute. Let's see, you can see it now, you see before I stamp it, because it may not be coming out just perfect. But we'll try to make it work. Here we go. Lexi. Bing. Oh, pretty, that's pretty good. Look at it, Lexi. That's pretty good. That's a heart with a hat on and shoes. And All right. Okay, you need to pay attention to William. He loves you. i tell you what. There you go. Isn't it pretty? A little heart. William, you want one, buddy? There you go. Look at that. Isn't that cool? Now, don't smear it. That ink is fresh. Nora, you're the cutest thing. If your parents want to get rid of you, I'll take you home with me. There you go. Look at that. We love redheads. We love little redheads. Sebastian, you know, with that buzz cut you got, I feel like putting one of these on your forehead. You know, you, your sister always won one on her forehead. And she's grown up now. She's a big girl, aren't you? See you, little girl. <clears throat> Father, make us the masters of ourselves that we might become the servants of others. Take our minds and think with them. Take our lips and speak through them, and take our hearts and set them on fire, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I have, I have oh, good morning, church. I didn't, I didn't start off that, but good morning. It's good to see you. I have one word for you this morning, one word, one word. Plastics. <laughs> now, some of you are old enough to remember the movie The Graduate, and Benjamin Braddock was from a wealthy family, and he just graduated from some wealthy school that was in the East. He comes back to Los Angeles to be with his family, and his mother and daddy have all their friends over. Nobody there is younger than they are except for him. And he's there, and they're all drinking and having a good time to celebrate this wonderful young man's start into the world. And one of his daddy's law partners says to him just one word, one word, plastics. Now, for you young people, that was a real important quote that became like a catchphrase for the 60s generation, the, those that were disillusioned and really didn't have any idea what to do with their life. But the one thing they did know is they didn't want to be involved in plastics, right, or anything like that. We get disillusioned sometimes. We lose our way. We can't get focused, right? 
And then there's always somebody, somebody right nearby that's going to tell us something really important. This is how you need to live your life. Right? This is what you need to do if you're going to live free and be happy. And that story is the story that we read for the first Sunday of Lent. Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, had come into the world and grown up. And now he was going to enter into the world and become what he was uniquely created to become. He had been given a purpose for his life, just as each and every one of us have, and he had been sent out. At his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended on him, and it appeared as a dove. And the Spirit pushes him out into the wilderness, Luke tells us. Luke's gospel is the only one that has the Spirit pushing Jesus out into the wilderness. And the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is very important to Luke's gospel. It follows itself through the Acts of the Apostles, and the Holy Spirit is the principal character in the Acts of the Apostles. And in this story, the Holy Spirit drives Jesus out into the wilderness. Have you ever been in the wilderness? Some of you? You've been in the wilderness? Like maybe the desert, right? Or deep forest, where there was nobody around, nothing but you, and things were either really quiet or as I remember when I was in a tropical rainforest once in Mexico, very loud, even though there seemed to be nothing around, nothing. Picture that inside of yourself, being in the wilderness, and then I want you to think about, have you ever been in the wilderness in a different way? Perhaps your life was unraveling. It seemed to be a never-ending cycle of something going wrong, something failing in your life, something that you really thought was solid is now soft and mushy. Your health, your job, your friendships, your love interests, your parents are failing. And you look around and you're feeling something that's really deep inside of you like a black hole. And you look around, there's nobody there. You ever been there? You look around, there's nobody there. You can't talk to anybody about it. I'd love to tell you about my problems, but I'm afraid that if I did, you would tell me about yours. Right? Or perhaps if I tell you about my problems, you'll listen for a few minutes and say, well, God bless you, and then walk away. Have you ever been there? you ever felt like that? I know you have. We all have at times. That's the wilderness that's much deeper and more dangerous than the wilderness in the desert. And Jesus went out into the wilderness. And he was there to discover what his true purpose in life was. And Satan comes up, the devil, the evil one, the liar, the deceiver. And he says one word, plastics, right? We've all had friends that, uh, or acquaintances that knew exactly what we needed to do, right? And they would never hesitate to tell us, you know, you'll do this. If you'll do this, everything will be okay, right? I mean, I found myself doing it today. Someone told me about something going on inside of them, and I immediately had some idea, this will help you. This, this will help you. Right? We do that, right? And the people do it to us. And whenever they do it, a lot of times we'll cringe, you know, because we'll say, oh, you know, I don't know about that. Right? And that's what was going on in this story today. Satan, the great deceiver, in the wilderness, no one around, comes to Jesus and says, hey, hey, listen, I've got an idea here for you. This will be a lot better for you than what you're doing you're hungry, right? Jesus hadn't been eating for 40 days. Have you ever gone one day without eating? Anybody nod one day without eating? Yeah. Have you ever done two days without eating? Two days? Two days? How about three? When I was a young man, when I was in college, I didn't have a whole lot of direction. I was kind of like Benjamin Braddock, and I really didn't know what I was going to do with my life, and I really wasn't concerned too much about it, except that I knew that I had to eat. 
And if I ate, it was going to cost me money. And I thought, well, I could learn to fast. I could learn to make sure that I didn't need food as much as I thought I did. And so I did. I fasted. I fasted for seven days. Seven days without food. Nothing but water. Now, it wasn't easy, I'm going to tell you. And I was a lot younger then, and I was in a lot better shape. But it was hard. Seven days without food. And I was hungry at the end of it. Hungry. Jesus had been in the desert for 40 days without food. 40 days. And he was hungry. And the devil came to him and he said, let me tell you something. This is what you need to do. You can use all that gift of yours, the great gifts and powers, to create bread out of those stones there. And, and listen, you, you, if you do it, you can not only feed yourself, you can feed all those other people. You can feed the whole choir. They could eat, right? And the congregation, right? Everybody could eat. Jesus took a deep breath. He thought about it for a second. Luke was a doctor. Luke was a guy that knew about formulas. He knew how to put chemicals together and make potions and give them to people and make them better, make them feel better. And uh, he, he knew a lot of stuff. But he'd also been on the journeys of Paul, and he'd seen Paul, and seen Paul speak eloquently about the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and suffer mightily for it. And he thought for a second, he thought, you know, uh, Jesus, I think Jesus, what he said, and of course this was part of the gospels that were going around, because it's, the story comes in, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so something happened, but no one was there with Jesus. And Luke says, well, you know, maybe the scripture, man does not live by bread alone, which was of scripture from Deuteronomy. Jesus would have said that. You've got to eat. But more importantly, you need the power of God surging through your body. That is what animates us. That's what makes us real. God's spirit moving in and out. The second temptation was that the devil took Jesus up to the highest point he could get. And he said, look out on the world around there. See all these kingdoms all around you. I have the power to run those kingdoms and you can have that power if you'll bow down and worship me. Jesus would have talk, taken a deep breath again. You know, a lot of times... We have things happen in our lives. We go astray, right? And we find ourselves doing things or saying things that are less than the best. And oftentimes they happen at times when we're not paying attention. Somebody will say something to us and we'll react, right? And we say something, snap back, and the next thing we know, we got a battle on our hands. And when we do that, we have to clean up the mess afterwards. Jesus knew about being a man and he swallowed whatever pride he may have had and he thought and he prayed and he said, you know, power is important. Luke would have known about power, but it's the power of God that we need. Luke would have known about Paul writing the letter to the Philippians and saying, you know, I've got a lot of education, more than any of you, and I've been around. I have been in leadership positions all my life, and I count all of it as lost to the power of God through Christ Jesus, the love of God through Christ Jesus. Luke would have known that. And Jesus said, you know, uh, you're to love the Lord your God. You can worship only him. The last temptation in the wilderness was a different temptation. It was one of spectacular presentation. It would draw all people to Jesus. If he jumped down from the temple and the angels caught him, everyone would follow. And suddenly, Jesus would have the world at his fingertips. Some of you are very successful in what you do in life, and oftentimes someone might come to you and they might say, you're really good at that. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing to remember. If you're really good at something, you'd like to know about it, wouldn't you? Yeah, sure you would. But remember this, it's a gift. And if somebody says to you, you're really good at that, pay attention to it because that's a gift. But remember it's a gift. God gave it to you and don't ever think that you got it on your own. 
Jesus knew that. He was the Son of God. He was with God in the beginning. He was God. And yet he knew he could not count equality with God something that could be grasped, something also from Paul's letter to the Philippians. And he turned to the devil and said, you know, I'm going to follow God. You probably all had friends that wanted to give you advice, and I used to play golf with this foursome, and I would ride in a cart with one fella, and the other two would ride in another cart. And there was one in the other cart that would watch the fella in my cart. He knew better than do it to me, and every now and then he'd hit a bad shot. He'd hit a shot that would go over here, over there. You, you know, we all do that in our life, right? We'll have something happen. We'll do something that, it ends us up in some sort of crazy situation that we didn't want, we didn't expect. And what happens is usually we'll take a deep breath, we'll right ourselves, and we'll get back on track and try to be the best we can be. And this guy was no different. He was a smart guy. And yet the one in the other cart would always give him advice. Well, do you, if you'll just do, listen, listen, let me, let me see. Pronate, pronate, one word, pronate, right? You don't know that. My hip turn, pronate. Okay, one word, plastics, right? And that's what, what this guy would do constantly during the round. And we'd laugh about it. I'd say, isn't it funny? He hits bad shots occasionally, but he thinks he can teach you about hitting bad shots, right? He was the golf advisor, right? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus was the God advisor. He is the God advisor. Luke knew all about formulas, but he knew one thing more important. He knew the power of the Holy Spirit pulsing in his body was the single most important thing that had ever happened to him. Jesus has some advice for us today. Here's the first advice. There are no formulas. You know, some churches will tell you, if you'll just say the words in the right way, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and I give myself over to him totally, then we'd be baptized, and now you've got it. Your ticket is punched, right? You don't ever have to, that ticket, ticket is good for eternity, right? And you'll never have to worry about anything again, because after all, you are in God's leadership at that time. Everything that happens to you from then on out, you'll be saved. And yet we still find ourselves getting in trouble, right? We've been baptized. We still find ourselves hitting a bad shot every now and then. And when that happens, there's only one thing to do. Don't settle. Now, y'all seen those direct TV ads? They're great ads. We have a direct TV person here today. Uh, they have the settlers, right? The settlers, they settle for less than the best. We want to just do... We, we're okay about this. You don't have to tell me anything. But we don't want to settle either. Because God wants us to have the best. Here's the formula. Here's the formula. This is the beginning of Lent. I know some of you have given up something for Lent. I know some of you have taken something on for Lent. And I applaud you for that. I think that's a great idea. But listen, it won't work. It's not going to get you into the kingdom of heaven. Right? It just won't do it. I mean, you can do it, and it's good for you. It's a really good thing to do it, but it won't work. It's not going to get you there. This is the formula. This is the Jesus who just told you there were no formula. Actually, has given us a formula, and this is the formula. Quit thinking you know anything. Quit thinking you have the answers. And realize that there's only one God, and you're not it. And you've got to trust in that God totally, totally, every day of your life. When you wake up in the morning, you say, thank you, God, for all the gifts you've given me and the gifts you're going to give me today and all the opportunities. When you go through your day, something goes wrong. Maybe you have an accident in your car. Maybe somebody tells you something really horrible at work. Maybe somebody isn't talking to you at work or somebody's not giving you the right answer for your medical needs. Maybe something in your family has gone wrong. Maybe your parents have started to fade and forget things. Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for those things, too. When you have a meal, thank God. 
Thank God for everything you get. Thank God in the evening when you go to bed. Thank God for every moment, every breath you breathe. And the more you do that, the more you practice that, just like these disciplines you've taken on or things you're giving up, you will begin to live into the Spirit of God. And it will become second nature. And you'll begin to feel what God has given you. And like Paul, you'll say, not I, but Christ liveth within me. And here's the second thing, the formula that Jesus will offer you today. The first part was, of course, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And this is the second one that Jesus says. He says, give and forgive. Give until it hurts and forgive always, no matter what happens. And here's how you begin that. Forgive yourself. When you hit a bad shot, forgive yourself. Get back up and start loving God with all your heart, your soul, and all your mind. And then the second one is to forgive. Forgive yourself and then give. Give to others. Give always. And that's the second one, to love your neighbor as yourself. If we practice those two things, we won't have to have anything else. Nothing. Nothing. You don't have to have a lot of knowledge to love God or to love your neighbor. I mean, you may have a lot of knowledge. I know it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out, but I live in the world of rocket scientists, and so I depend on all of you to do these really fun things that make our life a little bit easier. But all that knowledge is worthless compared to the love of God through Christ Jesus. This Lent, I want you to practice living into that Two, those two formulas, loving God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and everything you do every day, every waking existence, and loving your neighbor as yourself by giving constantly and forgiving always. And Jesus tells us when you live into that formula, you will have life, you will have joy, and you'll have that peace that passes understanding no matter what desert you go through, no matter what wilderness you find yourself in, Jesus will be with us to the end of the age. And that is good news. Those with ears to hear, let them hear.